Thank you everyone so much. I'm, I'm really excited to speak to Simon about uh, the key man and, and perhaps some of the uh, takeaway lessons from it. Um, Simon, I, I think it's useful for those who have not read the key man just to sort of start with the basics. Um, who is Abraj, who is Arif Nakvi, and what was the story behind their spectacular fall? So if I can take you all back to January 2018, the World Economic Forum is taking place in Davos. And Arif Nakvi, the founder of Abraj, is one of the celebrity financial superstars and regular speakers at, at Davos. In January 2018, Abraj was the largest private equity firm operating in emerging markets. It said it managed around $14 billion. And its investors included Bill Gates, who'd put $100 million into a $1 billion healthcare fund um, to build and expand hospitals and clinics in, in Africa and South Asia. The US government, the UK government, the French government were also investors in that fund, as was the World Bank's IFC unit. Um, Arif was on the board of the UN Global Compact, which advises the UN Secretary General on how private capital can help end poverty. He was also on the board of the Interpol Foundation, which is tasked with raising funds for Interpol, the global police force. Um, and at Davos in 2018, Arif was speaking on a publicly broadcast panel alongside Bill Gates, and they were talking about global health care, how to provide better health care to the billions of people who live on Earth. And while this was going on, um, I was a, a journalist at the Wall Street Journal in London, as was my, my co-author of the key man, Will Louch. And Will received an email from someone who would not give their name, saying that there was a problem at Abraj, that $200 million had gone missing from the healthcare fund, and that investors, including the Gates Foundation, were investigating where their money had gone. Um, so this was really the start of a year that we dedicated to writing about Abraj. Now, the, 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 the email came from someone who would not give their name. We still don't know who they are. So we couldn't use that email to write an article. So we started calling dozens of people to verify whether or not this was true. And very quickly, we found out it was true. Investors were investigating whether their money had gone missing. Um, so we called up Abraj. We spoke to an American executive who had previously been the US government's representative on the board of the World Bank. And he told us this was ridiculous. Abraj was a world-class firm, had the highest levels of governance. The question was frankly insulting. Abraj was regulated in seven jurisdictions. So it can't be true. But it was true. And we proved to our editors and the lawyers of the Wall Street Journal it was true. So we published on February the 2nd, 2018. And shortly after, the New York Times published an article on the same subject. Um, and Abraj was then deluged with questions from its investors and bankers about what was going on. And Abraj told them all that it was fake news. Um, so it would be unusual for the Wall Street Journal to write fake news and unusual for the New York Times to write fake news and very unusual for these two competing news organizations to write the same piece mm. of fake news and it, it wasn't fake news. And that was the beginning of a year that we, were, we, we didn't know that a barrage was going to unravel in the way it did. We found that money had gone missing from a second fund, from a third fund, and then by August of 2018, a chain of sources, so one person putting me in touch with another person who put me in touch with another person, put me in touch with a fourth person, finally agreed to meet me in a cafe that's actually 100 meters from here. And on their computer and their laptop showed me documents which showed that massive fraud and theft and attempted bribery of a prime minister of Pakistan had taken place. And so this these documents, which we knew the source of, enabled us to write a front page investigative feature in October 2018 about what was going on at Abraj. And basically what we showed, based on these documents, was that more than $600 million had moved from 
investment funds to a secret bank account at Abraj, and then more than $200 million had gone from that account to Arif Nakvi's offshore accounts and companies. Nothing happened for six months after we published this story until April 2019 when Arif was arrested at Heathrow Airport in London. The US Department of Justice had indicted him criminally, accused him of fraud and theft. He faced 291 years in jail if found guilty. Five other former branch executives were also charged. When Arif got off the plane, a British policeman you know, said, you're under arrest. And Arif said to the policeman, you can't arrest me. And the policeman said, why is that then? And Arif said, um, he checked with Interpol before he got on the plane, and there was no red notice, <laughs> so you can't arrest me. And the policeman said, he didn't need a red notice to arrest him, and sent him to Wandsworth Jail in South London, which is not a nice place for anyone to go. The US government didn't want to give Arif to get bail, as they said he would be a flight risk, he'd go to Pakistan, where he's from, where he was funding politicians, including uh, Imran Khan. Uh, so he wasn't granted bail until he finally offered £15 million, at which the judge said, OK, you can have bail, which shows that money talks better than even the most expensive lawyers, really. And so he's currently... He, his extradition to New York has been ordered by the UK courts and by the British government. He's currently living in South Kensington in his apartment. He says he's innocent. Um, he's appealing the extradition. That process is ongoing. Two of his colleagues who were charged have pleaded guilty. Um, and here we are. So why does this story matter? It matters for a lot of reasons, but particularly Abraj was a pioneer as a, in impact investing in private equity. Right. It was a pioneer in saying to investors that this firm could make money for investors and end poverty at the same time. So how did it say it could do that? By investing in companies and projects in developing countries across Africa and South Asia or Latin America building companies that didn't exist to provide services, whether it was in healthcare or education or food production. Abraj and Arif were very articulate, very compelling speakers, and convinced, you know, as I've told you, billionaires and Western governments to trust the firm with billions of dollars. And then, according to the Department of Justice, stole some of this money. Hmm. So a lot to unpack there, but let's start with this, this idea you just mentioned of investing in a developing world and really this ESG pitch. In terms of takeaways for the story for investors, perhaps not to the extent of a barrage, in what way are a lot of investors still blinded by ESG, sort of succumbing to whitewashing or greenwashing, as it were? So I think that's one of the questions of our time, because there is this transition which seems to be occurring in capital markets, whether people like it or not, from shareholder capitalism, where the one and only thing that mattered was maximizing returns to shareholders, to stakeholder capitalism, where <coughs> firms are required to generate strong returns for investors, but also consider the interests of their employees much more than they may have done in the past, and their customers, and the environment. Abraj was a very early mover in pitching itself as a, as a, as a key firm in this stakeholder capitalism movement. And the story shows that, you know, if we do transition to a, a stakeholder capitalist model, we're not going to have to stop asking questions about whether fraud is occurring or not. We may need to ask even more challenging questions about whether or not fraud is occurring because the scope of the promise from the investor has become that much greater. So Abraj wasn't just promising investors it could make money. It was promising us all that it could end poverty. And because of that promise, it was raising money from taxpayer-funded development finance institutions um, from the World Bank, from other public investors. It was also raising hundreds of millions of dollars from US public pension funds. 
And so I kind of feel that the, the scope for the upside of the promise is so much greater. You can make money and do good. And the downside is also considerably worse too. You can lose money and, mm. and betray us all, really. Is, is there an element to which you have KPMG as an accountant, you have investments from Bill Gates, you have talks alongside President Obama that investors can say, look, these people have more resources to do due diligence than I ever, yeah. I ever could. Yeah. So if they trust him, I will trust him. Yeah, one of the lessons of the Abraj story is that you know, even if Bill Gates or the US government are investors in a fund, it doesn't mean you don't have to do your own due diligence. I mean, we kind of knew that anyway, mm. but this is an important reminder that we have to do our own work, um, both as journalists and investors. We can't really take anything for granted. And that is hard in private equity, and especially hard in global private equity, because you have multiple layers of, 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 of the absence of transparency. Private equity is not particularly transparent. Private equity firms which are investing through funds incorporated in offshore financial jurisdictions or, or tax havens are difficult sometimes for investors and journalists to get information on. And Abraj did put on a great show with its networks of gaining credibility by association with powerful investors and politicians. And perhaps to some it gave comfort that Arif was on the board of the Interpol Foundation or that um, he was on the board of the UN Global Compact, or that Bill Gates was an investor, or that John Kerry spoke at one of his investment conferences and was perhaps considering joining the firm. Perhaps to others, those, those, those points would be a cause for concern in future. Hmm. Well, I, one more question for me, and then I do want to open up to the audience. To that point, what were the red flags you think investors missed in this? So there were quite a lot with hindsight. Mm. Um, Abraj used one accounting firm to audit all of its entities, and there were hundreds, you know, many, many entities. So the holding company, the fund management company, all the funds, many of the portfolio companies were, were audited by KPMG. And if you've read the book, you know there were some very serious problems with money moving in and out of funds at Abraj at the end of financial reporting periods to hide the absence of money in those funds. Now, if the accounting company had looked in those funds 10 days before the end of the reporting period, they would have seen there was no money there, but apparently they didn't look. Um, Arif's brother-in-law was the head of risk at Abraj. I mean, this was an institutional money manager. I always wondered, it's a bit odd, that there's a family member who has that role. And Three or four months before we received a whistleblower email, investors received one. Hmm. And it, everything that was in this whistleblower email turned out to be true. Um, Abraj was raising a $6 billion fund when it, when it got into trouble. This whistleblower email went to all the investors in this fund, including Hamilton Lane, which is one of the biggest and most expert investors in private equity in the US. And we know that Hamilton Lane asked Abraj about this email, like, so this email says there is fraud at Abraj, what do you have to say? Uh, and Arif responded to Hamilton Lane by saying something along the lines of, you know, this information is ridiculous, it's kind of offensive that you're asking us this question, of course this is not true. Now, what we found out through our reporting was that this kind of response was habitual. So towards the end of 2017, investors who had not received this whistleblower email started to realize there was a problem in the healthcare fund, because Abraj was requesting hundreds of millions of dollars for investors for the fund, and then apparently not investing it. So some of the investors started asking, well, what are you doing with the money, and where is it? A mid-level executive at the World Bank's IFC unit asked Abraj this question, and a mid-level executive at Proparco, the French government fund, also asked this question. And Arif responded by calling more senior executives at the World Bank and Proparco and saying, your employee is asking me a frankly offensive questions. This is really rude. We're a world-class firm. 
And in the, in the case of the World Bank and Propaco, these senior executives apologised to Arif. <laughs> now, the, the beginning of the end for Abraj really occurred in September 2017, when, after years of investing, the Bill Gates's, uh, Bill Gates Foundation's Andrew Farnham started asking questions. He noticed that there was a mismatch between money being called and money being deployed. So he asked which bank account the money was being kept in. And Abraj said, we don't really give this information usually, but we'll, we'll make an exception. It's in the Commercial Bank of Dubai. Um, and then two months later, he asked again. And the answer he got this time was it's in Standard Bank in the Cayman Islands. And this was the moment when you know, Andrew Farnham and the Gates Foundation was like, well, this is a money management firm. It doesn't really know where the money it's managing is. This is a serious problem. But then Arif called up a senior executive of the Gates Foundation and again complained about the more junior executive of the Gates Foundation, saying, I'm being asked frankly offensive questions. We're a world-class firm. But this time, the senior executive called the more junior executive into a meeting and said, what's going on? Andrew Farnham said, you know, I'm just asking straightforward questions. Really, we should be getting an apology, if anyone. And so the senior executive said to the junior executive, OK, continue with your line of questioning. In other words, the senior Gates executive supported his junior colleague. And that enabled Andrew Farnham to reach out to other investors in the fund and find out what was going on. So I really kind of have one message for investors from the Abraj story, key message, which is if you ask a reasonable question and you get an unreasonable response, then there's probably a problem. So don't apologize, keep asking questions. Well, that's probably a great point to pivot and get some reasonable questions from the audience. Um, does anyone have any questions? Or, or unreasonable ones. Or unreasonable. I'll, I'll try and answer. <laughs> anyone have any questions? There's one over there. Hi, Simon. Thank you for, for your keynote. My question is, why, why do we keep saying stories along the years? Uh, do you think it's a factor of greed, or what do you see that repeats every time? Because you just change the people who protagonize them, and it's over and over, just so changing the asset class, et cetera. So you're asking why do these situations keep occurring? Yeah, what, what is, the, what is the, um, the things that you, that you find that have uh, a lot in common with previous stories? It's a function of human nature. I mean, we're all a mixture of various virtues and perhaps vices. And uh, in the financial markets, people are innovating. And often they're innovating in a very legitimate way. But there's always a risk that they may innovate in a way that is not legal. And what we've seen is that when there is a fraud or a problematic situation, maybe regulation comes in to stop that particular malpractice from occurring, but then the innovation of humans may find a way around the next set of rules, which is why it's also very important to look at the, the morality of the investors and the integrity of what they're doing. I mean, for me, one of the key lessons of Abraj is that, you know, investors and politicians were only talking to top-level investors and politicians. And Abraj said it was trying to provide health care that would help people in very poor countries. But I didn't really see any evidence of investors speaking to potential customers, say, in Pakistan, who lived on a couple of dollars a day, who could have told those investors, this isn't going to work because we don't earn enough money to pay for their services, for example. Um, yeah, I think we have time for one more, if anyone has one. Here, over here. When you speak with different investors back following the story, do you believe that the unraveling of the Abraj story, does that permanently impact the region's ability to attract uh, foreign capital, whether in public markets, private markets? So does it publicly, does it permanently does it impact, permanently the, impact the, the region's ability, whether it's uh, the Middle East mainly, to attract foreign capital in, 
Um, I think it's been a problem for emerging markets, private equity funds. I mean, I know that investors such as the IFC are requesting higher or more diligence from funds that they may invest in, for example. I think there's a whole set of issues that Pakistan needs to work through related to, to a barrage. Um, impact investing as a term has continued to expand, particularly in the US. You know, we're seeing large traditional private equity firms like KKR and Apollo raising impact funds, but I think we really need to look at what exactly their impact funds are doing. And to what extent is it different from what their main private equity funds are doing? I mean, what, what do these firms, what do we all mean by impact investing or ESG? Right. I mean, this is a, I don't have a, a short-term answer, but this is an important question. And there, it's great that there is a conversation, a debate going on about this. It, the, the conclusion is not forget ESG or all in on ESG. We have to keep refining and modifying our understanding of what these terms mean practically. Hmm. Um, can't wait for your second book that dives into that even further. Everyone, please join me in thanking Simon Clark so much. Thanks very much, Thanks, Simon. Simon.